did security regulations become safety regulations? Kind of sounds a bit like a riddle, right? If a security regulation falls in the forest and no one is around, does a tree get hacked? Seriously, though, security in all shapes and sizes is more important than ever before. And yes, increasingly, security is a safety concern, especially when it comes to IoT device design. But navigating all of the global security regulations and certifications can have you getting lost rather quickly. Never fear. I've got a map. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk, security certification schemes in the world of the Internet of Things can be complex, but security identities and security certification inheritance can make this aspect of your IoT design quite a bit easier. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Mike Dow from Silicon Labs joins me to discuss the current state of global security regulations the difference between physical and logical attacks, and how Silicon Labs, SOCs, and modules can help you solve the security demands of your next design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Silicon Labs. Hi, Mike. Thank you so much for joining me. Glad to be here, Amelia. Thanks for having me. All right, so we're talking about how security regulations and certifications drive innovation today. So let's start with security. What are we looking at when it comes to IoT security legislation in the U.S. specifically? Yeah, so in the in the U.S., we're very state driven. The states tend to be ahead of legislation from the federal government. This is throughout our history. Security regulation is no different. I'm showing a a picture of the United States with blue states, showing basically those states that are looking at doing legislation, either they've already passed it or they're about to pass it. The first was the California Consumer Privacy Act, SB 327, that actually went into effect January 1st of 2020, so over a year ago. These laws are very short. If you actually go look at them, they're easy reading. It's about a page and a half. It doesn't really say a lot. And from a protection perspective, it really is trying to do something like GDPR, only a little lighter weight, but it does say things about security. And one of the things it states is uh, these IoT devices, and it actually doesn't even distinguish between consumer devices and say an industrial control system or building control system, which is a little odd, but it says things like reasonable security features, which doesn't sound bad, But then when you look at uh, the specific language, it says designed to protect the device and any information contained therein from unauthorized access, destruction, use, modification, or disclosure. A little bit of a mouthful, but basically if you're a security person, that means the device cannot be hacked. So that's kind of onerous, right? And kind of scary if you're a device manufacturer. Oregon is in March of last year enacted HP 2395. And as you can see in this list, there's a lot of other states that are actually looking at legislation as well. Okay, so Mike, the amount of regulation we are seeing in this realm is increasing, right? Yeah, it is. And this slide is basically showing some of the things that are happening at the national level. So as we stated, the states are leading, but you know, the government always gets wind of these things and doesn't like to be left behind. So as early as December of last year, IoT Cybersecurity Act of 2020 was enacted and passed into law in December. It was one of the last things that was passed by the Trump administration. This particular law doesn't read on consumer IoT devices, but it does read on IoT devices that are purchased by the federal government. And you may think, okay, well, that doesn't uh, affect the consumer world or even the world of Silicon Labs. Certainly, that's probably the case at NSA, but if you think about, you know, the Forest Department or something like that, uh, some other parks and recreation department that's federally regulated, they may have all kinds of IoT devices in their office space. So building controls are certainly in scope there, and that bill basically said, and that law says that NIST will define what their standards are, and so NIST has defined what's called A259D with 170-some-odd requirements And they're basically saying each of these government agencies needs to look at those requirements and decide which ones apply to them, create a a security profile, which is something we'll talk about in a little bit, and then meet those. So it's going to be pretty daunting for those government bodies when they have to actually adhere to this law. And I believe that they have to start sending out RFPs by the end of 
2021 this year. The other thing that just happened recently in March was uh, something called the Cyber Shield Act. Popped up last year, but kind of got washed under with all the last minute, uh, you know, presidential stuff that was happening. But it popped back up again in March. And this particular bill would basically stand up a certification scheme or a labeling scheme for consumer IoT products. So this specifically goes to that type of product. The other thing that just happened in May was that Biden uh, has an executive order that reads on IoT cybersecurity, and that executive order actually does stand up the same kind of requirement for a labeling and a certification process for IoT consumer devices as well. So, Mike, how do these regulations work together? This is a picture, kind of a map of everything that's going on, a heat map of sorts. Up in the upper left-hand corner, you've got the regulations that are happening at the state level. You have what's happening at the national level with uh, NIST, so National Institute of Standards and Technology, is where the courts are going to be driven to look for what is reasonable. And NIST has created something called A259A, and they actually did this before the IoT Improvement Act was passed. And this reads on IoT security, IoT consumer devices. So that's the list over to the right. That has device identification, device configuration, logical access to interfaces, software firmware updates. So that's a much more definitive list of requirements rather than just saying reasonable requirements. So A259A, we think, will be what is going to be come into vogue when the courts start looking at what is reasonable security and also with the Executive Order and the Cyber Shield Act, which are consumer-type regulations, then NIST A259A will be the list of requirements. For the IoT Improvement Act, it'll be NIST A259D, which is actually a larger set of requirements. Kind of on top of all of that, you've got ISO brewing. So ISO, NIST is really a U.S. only standards body, right? So very few companies or countries in Europe worry about NIST. But if you deal with the U.S. government, U.S. government usually adopts any NIST guidelines and so forth. Uh, Not that they're not great guidelines, they're just not internationally recognized. ISO is different. ISO is an international organization that is actually staffed by countries. And so they have the ability to take these type of requirements and formulate a government recognized across the world type standard. And so ISO is looking at these type of standards for IoT as well. And that's the ISO 27402. So that's kind of the United States landscape. Okay, Mike. So what about Europe? How does Europe compare to the U.S. in this arena? So Europe is a bit different than the U.S. Uh, I've been following standards bodies in the U.S. for quite some time. Europe likes to be much more methodical than we are. So the EU, the whole idea of the EU and these countries, you can kind of think of them as states, but they do try to come up with standards. They spend a lot more time developing the standards, but they do tend to come out with standards that will apply to all of the EU. And there's actually a government body called ANISA, which is their cybersecurity government agency for Europe, who has been tasked by a law that was passed in the EU to decide what are the IoT consumer requirements and what are the certification schemes. They haven't decided that yet, but there is a front runner, and that's from ETSI, and that's the European Telecommunication Standards Institute. They have come up with something called EN303645. And that looks very much like the NIST standards. It has a lot of the same things, keep software updated, securely store your credentials, minimize exposed attack surfaces, ensure software integrity. A lot of the same undercurrents are happening in Etsy, I believe, that Etsy will be picked as the requirements for Europe. We are already seeing Australia, Singapore, the UK, Finland adopt Etsy EN30645 as their kind of baseline for their IoT cybersecurity regulation. So Mike, there's a big difference between what is required by law and what is functionally required by the market and the device type, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's a fairly complicated world. This is uh, the picture I've drawn to try to put some sense to that in my own head. You have the laws over on the left that, you know, the state what's legally required, but these tend to be very vague, like the reasonable security statement. Then the laws basically direct certain agencies to come up with the exact requirements. So then you have requirements, which are like the NIST 8259A through D standards or ISO 27402, or in the industrial world, IEC 62443, or even the FDA. 
But you have government agencies that define functional security requirements, right? Just like safety requirements. Now, skipping over to the right is the certification of those security requirements. So now you've got a list of requirements, but how do you make sure that people are truly abiding by the requirements? So now you have to talk about security certifications, and there are lots of standards around that. But one thing I want to point out is that security certifications are not telling you what security you have in a particular device. It's just giving you a yardstick to measure that security. Typically, these are like uh, level one, level two, level three certifications, level one typically being a, a self-certification, level two being a black box certification. In other words, you don't, you don't have any insider information on what's inside the device. And then level three is a white box certification, which is basically you do have some information on the inside of the device. And then you can go up to four and five, which are get into how do you manufacture the product? How do you make the product securely? That sort of thing. But again, these certification schemes, and there, there are many of them, we'll talk about IXT Alliance, but UL has done one for IoT. The most well-known one is ISO 15408, which is a common criteria standard. Uh, it's an ISO standard for security, but it's mainly been used for secure elements that go into passports and credit cards and not much else. It's a bit heavy and it takes you know a year, year and a half to get that kind of a certification. There's also something called CSIP, which is basically a lightweight common criteria that's being basically adopted by global platforms in Europe that might take uh, precedence in Europe. But a lot of certification schemes, a lot of flux there as well. But again, these are just standards on how to certify a device consistently, because what you don't want to do is give a device to different labs around the world and get different results, especially if you're in competition with your with somebody else and they got an easy certification and you, and you got a hard one, right? But the other thing is all these certification schemes have the idea of a security target. And a security target is where you define what security will be evaluated. So you could put one thing on that list in your security target, like a secure boot, or you could put multiple things on that list, like secure boot, security bug, over the updates and some other functions, right? And then you submit that security target to the certification scheme and you say, okay, I want it level one tested, level two tested, level three tested. That's a really good way of doing things. The problem is where are these uh, security targets coming from? And, and it could be different for every product. So this is where the idea of a security profile comes in or a protection profile in the common criteria language. So the idea of a protection profile or a security profile is a genericized security target. For these devices. So if you think about a contact switch, a wireless contact switch in your home, that probably has very low security requirements compared to the thermostat in your home or your Xbox. Because these are bigger attack surfaces, they have a lot more security requirements. And so really the idea of a security profile is that what you want is the five biggest manufacturers of a particular device type get in a room and decide what is the right amount of security for that type of device? And they create a security profile for that type of device that then becomes the recognized security profile that everybody uses. And the idea here is at the end of the day, we do need to get to a point where a consumer will be able to pick up a device at their electronics store and know that it has the right amount of security for that type of device. I always use the analogy of when electricity was being rolled out in the early 1900s in the U.S., there were really no safety regulations on electrical equipment that you might put in your home, electrical appliances. And so there were a lot of fires. A lot of people died. And the government stepped in and created, basically, UL became a big thing at that point because everything had to go through UL, UL testing from a safety perspective, electrical safety perspective. And now you walk in and you buy an appliance in a store and you don't worry about it burning your house down. But the problem we have today is that people walk in and buy a video camera off the shelf from somebody or off of Amazon, and they don't have any idea what level of security it's at. They just assume that it's going to protect them because they, we've grown accustomed to that, but we're not there yet. So we've got to get to the point where these security profiles define what is the right amount of security. And we get to the point where there's a certification scheme for all of that. and Hopefully, years from now, we'll be able to pick up devices and know that they're protected from a security perspective. That makes sense. Now, we also need to talk about chip level certifications too, right? What does that landscape look like? At the end of the day, 
most IoT devices have a brain, right? They either have a MCU or an MPU that does most of the security functions. So a lot of these things that are being required by the regulations, like secure debug, secure boot, all of those things really are enabled by the silicon, the main MCU or MPU brain, either running Linux or an RTOS or bare metal. And so you have to start there, right? So there are certifications. PSA was enacted by ARM and is now run by PSACertified.org. was a great thing because ARM basically was the first company to go to all the silicon manufacturers and say, how do you think is the best way to do security? Because before that, you went to 10 companies, they all, would all tell you 10 different ways of doing security in a microcontroller or an MPU. So what the great thing that ARM did was they created this platform security architecture, which basically divides things into secure and non-secure, and then further divides things, but basically came up with a security architecture that all the silicon vendors could agree to. And when PSA was launched, PSA Certified was launched, you saw most of the major silicon manufacturers got PSA Level 1 certified. Then PSA Level 2 and 3 are really getting into the attack vectors. So PSA Level 2 says not only do you have the architecture, but you can assure yourself against remote attacks. And then PSA Level 3 brings in physical attacks. Now, I mentioned CSIP before, which is the Lightweight Common Criteria, and and that stands for Security Evaluation for IoT Platforms. This also has a level two and three, and I have been working with ARM and CSIP organizations for a while, applying pressure, because what I didn't want to have to do is basically do multiple certifications, because, you know, some people would gravitate to the Lightweight Common Criteria in Europe. Some people might do PSA Certified. These cost a lot of money to do these certifications. So the good thing is, is that PSA Certified and CSIP have come together. They've created a common protection profile, the PSA Certified CSIP protection profile. And you can use that profile and you can go through a lab evaluation and you can submit for both PSA Certified Level 2 or 3 or CSIP Level 2 or 3. So they're equivalent now. So that's the great thing about you know, that's happened, I think it's a really good thing for the industry because now I can actually, as a silicon vendor, go and get a single certification that covers both. Okay. So Mike, I have also heard that the IOXT Alliance is working on these issues as well. Absolutely. Silicon Labs is a proud member of the board of directors for IOXT Alliance. And I'll, I'll talk a lot more about what IOXT Alliance is, but you can see from this slide, we have a lot of the big hitters in the market for consumer IoT, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Residio, Legrand, Comcast, T-Mobile, and the ZB Alliance is also a member of the board. And we have a ton of companies, right? This particular alliance is growing leaps and bounds. And the two main things they're focused on is device security profiles being that place where the big five manufacturers of a particular type of device can sit in a room and create a security profile. And then also making sure they spin up a security certification scheme that is very scalable. So, Mike, how is this alliance aligning its requirements to all of the regulations you just talked about? So IXT has taken into account the basic tenets of Etsy and NIST requirements, and they boil them down to a base set of requirements called the security pledge. You'll notice a lot of the same type of requirements. So you've got uh, secure interfaces, proven cryptography, in other words, don't make up your own cryptography. Over on the right-hand side, automatic secure updates, verified software, which is signed software, which is a secure boot. So a lot of the same Looking at the regulations, looking at the landscape, they about it's almost been almost two years now. They stood up this security pledge and it's held up pretty well against these regulations. So the security pledge represents the base security for IXT. Okay. So what does the certification process look like here? So, again, uh, a main objective IOXT Alliance was to stand up a certification process that could scale quickly and adopt new technologies and new certifications quickly as well. So you've probably heard of bug bounties, but what they've done is create something called certification bounties. So you can do a self-certification, which is a quick thing to do, but the problem with doing self-certifications is how do you know that the company didn't fudge a bit? Well, if you put a bounty on their product and people can make money by proving that you didn't do the certification right, then that pretty much self-regulates. I think that's the most innovative thing that IOXT has done in making sure that you can scale this. Now, you can still go through the labs and do the lab certifications as well for added proof, but you do have the ability to do 
self-certifications and you can do those quickly and you can do them fast. And so you can get a lot of products certified quickly. You know, it's a bit of the honor system, but again, we, it self-corrects with the certification bounties that are placed on top of it. Okay. So Mike, can you walk me through how this would work in a real life design? Yeah. So another tenant of IOXT is inheritance. A couple of problems we're trying to solve. A lot of the security certification schemes today are very cumbersome and take a long time, and they don't allow inheritance. So inheritance is the idea that I can do a certification at a silicon level, and anybody using my silicon or my modules can inherit those certifications. Like I spent a great deal of money on PSA and CSIP certifications. Why shouldn't my customer be able to inherit that? So that is something that IOXT embraces. My products are basically base components of end IoT devices. And IOXT Alliance is not necessarily in the business of certifying submodules, although they do basically to help the market. But at the end of the day, we want end devices to be certified. The role I play in that is that I get my certifications for my chips and my modules. There's a pull down list. Basically, the person pulls down. I'm using Silicon Labs XG22, and they populate that. And then now all of the certifications like Secure Boot, Security Bug, and all of that now is inherited by the device manufacturer. And so going to the next slide where I'm showing the base profile, this is a representation of that base profile in a different way. It's actually using these stack boxes, left to right, uh, different colors, and then they have different levels. And these are basically the detailed requirements or the test cases. So you have level one requirements, level two, level three, level four, and level five. So you can certify at different levels, but there is a default required level. So the yellow arrow basically shows the requirements that are required all the time. So what I'm showing in this slide is that there are certain requirements. Notice the PSA certification inherited here. So the proven cryptography, anti-rollback, software image verified at boot, secure boot, based on hardware, all four of those requirements are inheritable by my PSA certification. And then when you look at it from a module perspective, I can do even more. So these are the starred things I have here. Like I can take care of secure debug, secure boot with a bootloader that I pre-flashed. From a certification of stacks, Zigbee, Thread, and Wysun, I can pre-certify those at a platform level through those organizations, and those can be inherited as well. And then I can do an over-the-air update if I can pre-flash a bootloader onto the part as well. So there's a lot of inheritance that I can do at Silicon Labs that helps my customers get to market quicker. The next slide is actually just showing how that stacks. So you have the base security profile. And like I said, maybe that's not good enough for a particular type of device, like a smart speaker. So this slide is an actual smart speaker security profile that's being approved by IOXT Alliance. This is where Google, Amazon, and others sat in a room and decided what the security needs to be for a smart speaker. And they came up with this particular security profile. And you can see that the base requirements increased on the verified software. So now Secure Boot, based on hardware, is a hard requirement for that particular profile. And then the next slide is about how we can also take the base profile and modify it per these regulations. So this is a profile for Etsy 303.645, and it shows the yellow star, uh, the diamonds represent the base requirements that are hard requirements. You can see how this can be modified and easily extended for the changing world, right? But the idea is to create whatever the market desires from a security profile perspective, IOXT Alliance can deliver that. Mike, if I'm working with a third-party manufacturer, do my certifications come along with my design? It does if you're going through IOXT Alliance. Like I've talked about, the inheritance is really the important key aspect there. And this is my simplified diagram to show that, right? So the chip, you know, the inheritance of the secure vault capabilities, the PSA, CSIP over in the left-hand side, you extend that to the modules, development kits. And now all the third-party device manufacturer has to do is what we call a Delta certification. So they click the devices that are already pre-certified for, let's say they're a company that's building something for Europe and the U.S. And so they need to be NIST 802 compliant and they need to be Etsy compliant. They would basically pick our parts, which would be pre-certified for those security profiles. And then they might be building a smart speaker. And so they would have to do the Delta requirements on top of that for a smart speaker. 
But everything that we did would be inherited, and now they just do the simple Delta certification. And you can see how that would be a lot less work for them. Absolutely. So, Mike, now that I have a secure device joining a third-party ecosystem that meets all of the regulations, is there anything else that this ecosystem needs to worry about? Yes, uh, there's another trend in the large cloud ecosystem, such as Google Cloud, Azure, AWS IoT Core. You know, they want a lot of devices to attach to their cloud ecosystems, right? They would love to have thousands of devices that attach to their ecosystems. But the problem is, is how do you trust those devices? How do you know they're secure? They could be rogue devices with malicious intent. They could be counterfeit devices. So the way that you prevent that is you, you introduce the idea of a secure identity where you can do a test station. So we are working on services to actually inject secure identity into our chips at manufacture. Our secure vault parts uh, have that coming out of our factory. And this allows you to do an attestation of the device at the end of the day to basically make sure it's not a rogue device or a fake device. That makes sense. Now, Mike, can we step back a bit? What do you really mean by secure identities? Yeah, secure identities are like a birth certificate for a device. Secure identities allow you to trust the device is authentic, trust that the device is a specific device it claims to be. Some of the common uses for secure identity is to ensure that the component is authentic. This is a supply chain issue. Ensure that the product is authentic, prevent anti-counterfeiting. You can support remote authentication of a communication link, for instance, and you can set aside regulatory requirements as well. The next slide I'm going to show you to kind of hone in on that messaging is in the past, for the last 10, 15 years, security has always been about securing the pipe between two end nodes. And that was it. But with the idea of a secret identity in the chip, now the end node security is in scope because the secret identity is really a secret key at the end of the day that's protected in that device. And, you know, there was a moment in time where the secure element guys were basically pitching that just put a secure element next to your unsecure microcontroller and everything will be fine. You have a secure system, but really all you can attest to is that that secure element is on the board. And certainly you can store your keys securely and that's great. But what you can't do is know that your microcontroller hasn't been compromised. So the idea of secure microcontrollers became in vogue about four or five years ago. But when you have a secure micro next to a secure element, you still have to do binding between the two. And what we've done in our products moving forward is we've actually taken that goodness of the secure element and moved it into the microcontroller. But the main driving force for that was this physical security that you need to have now for your device. Now, it seems like physical attacks are now easier than ever before. Is that also what you're seeing? Yeah, absolutely. You know, before you could just obfuscate the key, you could just shove it somewhere where nobody didn't know where it was. But there are tools now that are coming on the market that are very cheap. So side channel analysis is one of the methods to actually just put a probe next to the chip and through side channel power analysis, you could actually determine when the cryptography is happening. And if you can get that time down, you can basically run traces of the spurious emissions and so forth. And through statistics, you could actually discover the keys. It's a bit magical. And it used to be really hard. It used to be a PhD, you know, a million dollars worth of equipment and a lot of time. Now you can buy something like Chip Whisper from New AE off the web. And this $3,000 device will essentially do the same thing. You don't have to have a PhD. You don't even really need to know what you're doing very much. You still have to have a lot of time, but you don't have to have expensive equipment either. The other thing that's happened is glitching used to be a physical attack that was very hard to do. And now you've got tools like Chip Shouter, again, the same company, $3,000, and you can do some very sophisticated glitch attacks, you know, to basically glitch open a, a debug port or something like that and get access to the debug port and be able to dump all the whole contents of the flash and know everything about the part. So, Mike, can you explain the difference between physical attacks and logical attacks? Logical attacks are still easier than physical attacks, right? Yeah, they are. And if you look at this particular diagram, this is where I start with customers trying to explain attack vectors, because you really do, at the end of the day, have to get down to what are you trying to protect against to really talk about security. So remote attacks, local attacks are the two main categories. Remote attacks being, I don't have the device in my hand, I'm trying to do this over the wire or over 
wireless, either close range or long range. And then local attacks is where you have the device in your hands and you can spend some time with it, maybe even in a lab. That's further divided into logical attacks and physical attacks. Logical attacks being attacks on software and then physical attacks being attacks on the silicon itself, the ones and zeros, trying to get the silicon to do something it's not supposed to. And so if you look at uh, where things are today, most of the attacks, 70, 80% of them are in the upper left-hand quadrant, which is the logical remote attacks. And malware injection is still where you want to start because if you can take over the device completely, great. Our main weapon against that is secure boot, and that's why the regulations are honing in on that. Buffer overflows and logical faults are really runtime attacks. A secure boot will make sure that the device is secure when you boot it, but what if it's not being rebooted or reset very often? You could still do these buffer overflow and logical faults. And this is where the stacks, the communication stacks need to be hardened. And then if you move down to local attacks, you know, again, logical attacks are still the easiest thing to do. Glitching the debug port open is probably the easiest thing to do. And that's when we have secure debug in our products. And again, that's why regulations are honing in on that. But you can do things like trace tampers in the case and so forth for protecting components inside as well. And then you move over to the right, which is the local physical attacks. And this is where differential power analysis, glitching, and probing come into play as well. In our world, in the microcontroller world, we don't worry about the upper right-hand quadrant, the cache timing, the row hammers. Those are uh, high-speed memory attacks. And those are Linux machines, which uh, Silicon Labs doesn't do. We do microcontrollers. Okay, so what is Silicon Labs doing specifically to address these issues? We believe that there's, depending on the attack vectors, right, whether it's remote attacks or local physical attacks, you need the right security. So we have our products divided in our Secure Vault trademark, which is basically a trademark over all of our security. We have base, we have mid, and we have high. So base is about protecting the pipe between the end nodes. So that's the cryptography. It's not no security right? It's just worrying about the pipe, which is good enough for a lot of applications. And then we have mid-security, which is really about remote attacks and meeting that PSA level two requirement or CSIP level two and a black box attack, which makes sense because of remote attacks, you you don't have it in your hand. So it's not really, it's a black box attack. You don't have any insider information, can't open the device up in any way. And that requires, you know, secure boot, secure debug. We threw DPA countermeasures in there. That's a physical attack. And you may ask why, and it's because it's so easy to do now. So we pulled that one from what we consider a physical attack vector over into that category. And then we have our high, secure vault high parts, which add all the physical local attack vectors and include the anti-tamper, the secure attestation, secure key management, and some advanced crypto as well. And this is what we've gotten PSA level three certified. So we are the first to achieve PSA level three with that secure vault high. First silicon ever. And that means MCUs, MPUs, wireless, wired, doesn't matter, right? We're the first silicon ever to get PSA level three, which is remote attack vectors plus physical attack vectors as well. Okay. So Mike, if I'm ready to get started, where should I go for more information? So a good place to start is scilabs.com slash security. We have a lot of information there, a lot of webinars, more details on the things I've been talking about in there. And when you're ready to buy, uh, of course, go to www.mauser.com and you can buy our modules or our SOCs from Mauser. Excellent. Well, Mike, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Amelia. Appreciate it. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Silicon Labs. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.